presentation, I'm going to show you the species distribution model that I used to, a series of species distribution models that I used to try to estimate the potential ecological niche of domesticated plants, more specifically buckwheat in the past. But what I would like to talk about through this case study is a much broader range of uh, archaeological problems that can be addressed with the use of statistics that I use, which have to do with how to model uh, the probability of certain phenomena occurring across space based on point locations. Uh, and uh, this has quite a wi wide range of applications. One of the more popular ones that you may be familiar with is the predictive modeling of archaeological sites. Uh, but there are also other ones, and these models are increasingly used in archaeology. So to give you a little bit of the context about the model that I'm using, uh, I co I'm constructing this model as part of the interdisciplinary project uh, joint, uh, run jointly between the University of Cambridge and the University of Bristol uh, called uh, Crops, Pollinators and People, or Short and Buggy. Uh, and uh, the aim of this project is to investigate the domestication uh, and of buckwheat and uh, its spread after the domestication. Uh, so what we know is that it probably originated somewhere in the uh, southeastern China, although this is currently also being disputed. And uh, what I would like to find out is when it was domesticated, where were the likely areas where it could have spread given the environmental constraints, um, and map them uh, to see where we can like, look for them or where it, where it uh, could have spread. And uh, the other aim is to also uh, investigate what will the impact of the different environmental variables on the spread, uh, and ultimately uh, see whether also biotic interactions uh, could have had an effect because uh, buckwheat is one of the few crops that heavily rely on pollination uh, for its uh, dispersal. So to address this problem, uh, I decided to use the species distribution modeling, which, uh, which is widely used in, for this purpose in ecology. And species distribution models generally take the series of environmental layers. Uh, the ones that I'm using uh, are the environmental reconstructions from, for meat holocene uh, taken from watch clear. Uh, and uh, it uses the information about the location of the species, which can be represented as a point locations. Um, so where the species was present and also where the species was absent, uh, or as an abundance. So uh, for example, how much uh, we can have a look at how much buckwheat is currently produced uh, in the world. So the two modelic algorithms that I I'm trying to explore uh, are the uh, Bayesian approach, and uh, which isn't that widely used, but a lot of people argue that uh, it could be very useful for estimating uh, the species distribution, um, especially if you have very little data. Uh, and the more widely uh, used one is the uh, maximum entropy approach. And uh, before I show you the model, I would just like to highlight the differences between these approaches. Uh, so the Bayesian model that I'm using specifically is the binomial ICAR model, and uh, it's Estimate, uh, it assumes that the likelihood of finding buckwheat in any uh, space or in any raster cell uh, is distributed binomially, so it can be, have a value of 0 or 1. Uh, and it depends on how many times you look into the place, so how many trials you had, in our case only one, because uh, if we have the archaeological sites, we check the archaeological sites once. Uh, and the probability uh, that the buckwheat actually was at this site. And uh, the probability, uh, uh, to estimate the probability, uh, we use the logit function, which scales it to be between 0 and 1. Uh, and the probability is a linear model uh, based on the relationship between buckwheat and the environmental variables. Uh, and in this case, uh, the uh, Bayesian model needs both the records of buckwheat presence and the records of buckwheat absence. And presences are actually way more straightforward, even though we managed to find only 26 in the Southeast Asia. Uh, and these were pollen records, macro fossils, and micro fossils. Uh, and there, there are many different approaches to estimate absences if you don't have actual absence data. 
In this case, I looked at the archaeological sites uh, where you had archaeobotanical investigation and you could find other crops, but not necessarily buckwheat. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this is how the Bayesian approach tries to figure out where buckwheat was distributed in the past. Uh, maximum uh, entropy uh, approach uh, works slightly different and uh, it actually estimates different things. It doesn't directly estimate the probability. So it assumes that there was a backward distribution in the past that we don't know, we, we don't know how it looked. But we have a random uh, sample of points from this distribution. And Max and Alvarez tries to work back what was the most likely distribution that would have given you this random points. Uh, and uh, in order to make the actual model, it, it uses uh, machine learning to estimate the effect of the environmental variables using the, just trying to pick different response scores and see which ones will give you the, uh, the probability distribution that is most likely. So this is the Bayesian model that I constructed. Uh, and uh, this is the probability map, the, the mean predictions uh, that resulted from this Bayesian model. Uh, uh, the empty dots are the ones that are empty sites without backwood. The full dots are the sites where backwood was found. Uh, and the darker the color, the higher the probability according to this model. Uh, and these are the so called counterfactual uh, plots. So they show you what's the effect of every variable on the probability of finding buckwheat, uh, where all the other variables are kept at the value, uh, which is the uh, mean value uh, at the sites where buckwheat was found. Uh, and the, the envelope around it is the 95 confidence interval. So the model is 95% sure that the curve runs somewhere through this area. And uh, as you can see, this model is not really very sure where to find backwards, especially if you look at the effects of precipitation. Uh, the envelope runs, uh, first is kind of narrow, but then basically the, uh, runs very widely from zero to one. So what this model actually tells me is not that this is the right distribution of backwards. This is the best thing can, it can do, but it's not really sure. So the answer I'm getting here is, that the model doesn't really know. Uh, so obviously it's not the answer I hoped for. And most models would never give you that answer. You throw the data at it, and it will give you a model. It won't tell you how certain it is that this is the real distribution. And this is why I think it's a, one of the strengths of Bayesian approach, is that um, the I don't know answer is still a better answer than the wrong one. <laughs> So, and, yet, and this is uh, just to highlight it. Uh, this is when you, how you can plot uncertainty. So this is your worst case scenario, but you cannot be found almost anywhere. Uh, this is your best case scenario. So some areas have yes. basically, yeah, you should have back in there, which obviously doesn't make sense. You don't grow back with the double thing like So alternative approach is much sense, as, as I told you. Uh, it's, it works differently, so it doesn't use the absence data, which I think is the reason why we couldn't get a good estimate with the Bayesian model in this case. We didn't have real absences, and the ones that are used are not a good proxy. Uh, so this model makes much more sense. Uh, we can see that the high probability of uh, finding buckwheat is in the areas where it was actually found. That's good. Uh, these are the curves that represent the estimate the effects of different environmental variables. Uh, and uh, since Maxert uses machine learning to estimate that, uh, I run it a few times and every time you get slightly different results. So some of these variables uh, get curves that overlap quite a lot, like uh, mean temperature of the dry water. But you can see that even in this case, the estimate of the precipitation, it's not that good, which points out that uh, None of the models are really sure about how the precipitation affects backwood, and this is something I would like to further explore later. For example, have a look at their, whether uh, there's some kind of interaction between precipitation or temperature that can uh, improve the model. Mm -hmm. But the question is how reliable are, the, are these estimates? Because we, we don't have uncertainty here in the, in the Bayesian sense. 
So there, there are some ways that can be uh, used to look into whether the model is reliable or not. One is to look whether we can uh, try to predict from the past data the current distribution of buckwheat. Uh, and these are max and prediction for the modern times uh, compared against the uh, current distribution of buckwheat. This is data as production in tons. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's roughly, it's, it shows similar R less, it's not perfect, but uh, it, it predicts it quite well. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we cannot be sure. And uh, since Maxent doesn't use absences, but uses the background data, um, we, we need to have the assumption that the data points that we got is random, which I think in archaeology it's fairly difficult to get because there, there may be a range of um, factors that affect uh, that affect it that are not related to environmental variables. So this is the best we can do with Max and Bayesian model. There is one more approach that I'm trying currently, which is to look at the current distribution of uh, look at the current distribution of buckwheat. So the production in tons this data uh, to fit the Bayesian Poisson model. Um, it looks, uh, it works slightly differently than the binomial one, so it doesn't estimate the likelihood of finding buckwheat of the likelihood of one, but it estimates the amount of buckwheat that you would like to get uh, uh, at a certain place. Uh, and uh, as you can see, this model looks uh, much more reliable. Uh, th these are again the mean, uh, mean distribution, mean probability of distribution. Uh, and these are the uh, res uh, response curves of various environmental factors uh, together with the envelope. And you can see that they are much more narrower. The model in this case is much more certain that this is how buckwheat responds to an environment. Especially if you compare the mean temperature of the dry water, uh, the curve is very similar to the one estimated by Max and with the peak at around zero uh, and quite a wide uh, range of temperatures that are suitable and this is something that uh, makes sense ecologically because buckwheat is known to uh, thrive in a quite wide range of temperatures specifically between um, between about 10 degrees and 30 degrees but not in the dry spot the dry spot is just it's just a proxy of how other uh, of what uh, temperatures are found uh, during the buckwheat growing season. Uh, and again, there's quite a lot of certainty about the effect of uh, precipitation, but much less in both other models, max and the binomial um, Bayesian model. Uh, so this is again your uh, worst case scenario, uh, your best case scenario. But with max and uh, I, uh, I mean with the uh, with a poisson Bayesian model. As I said, it doesn't directly estimate probability, so this is just relatively uh, which areas are more suitable and which areas are, are less suitable. So even, even if there is an uncertainty about the difference in suitability, uh, you can still identify the areas that would be suitable for growing buckwheat. Uh, the thing is that these are, these are obviously the predictions for, uh, for the modern times. Whereas uh, currently I'm working on using this model to predict the past distribution of buckwheat and this is still the work in progress. So this will be the next step. Mm. So in conclusion, uh, between the two models that work, we got, uh, I got the uh, quite consistent estimation of the effect of the mean temperature of the dry water. So we can see that this is clearly has an effect and uh, which so if the probability grows at first that the temperature increases, peaks, and goes down. Um, there is a lot of problems with the estimation of the precipitation. Um, so that leads me to think that I, I need to think a little bit more about uh, how it can interact with other variables and try to incorporate these interactions in the, into the models. And uh, the future w work is to fit the model based on the present distribution to estimate the past distribution of buckwheat. Yeah. And conclusions in terms of model performance. Uh, as the uh, first Bayesian model shown, it is crucial to have the reliable estimate of the absences, because actually let me go back 
here for a second. Uh, because as you can see, it's not sure about the precipitation and the mean temperature of the driest water also has a quite uh, large envelope at the lowest temperatures. And as you can see on the map, the lowest temperatures are more to the north and in the Himalayas, uh, which are the areas where we neither have presences nor absences. So this also points you out of where are the problems with your data. Um, and uh, apparently, since uh, we have only re reliable presences, max and um, seem to be better results, it's more reliable, but on the condition that we have a random sample, which is not a given. Uh, and the final conclusion is that, as I have shown that, uh, I think the mo most important strength of the Bayesian approach is that it can make so cautious against the uh, overconfidence in the model's predictions because it doesn't give you just one prediction but also shows you uh, where your model is uncertain about the results. So, thank you very much.